Father, we come today very aware that this time of year we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And Lord, we are also aware that the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, the incarnation of the Son of God, means so much more than just a seasonal holiday for us. Jesus Christ is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the light who has come into the world. He's the Messiah, the King, who comes to drive out the darkness and defeat our enemy. He's the living water. He's the bread of life. He's our Savior, our Master, the one who laid down his life for his friends. Father, help us to fix our gaze on Christ this morning. And I pray that as we consider his birth and the significance of his birth, that our hearts would go from here uh, refocused, encouraged, strengthened in our faith, and with a deeper desire to love and worship you. Amen. Well, welcome to Redemption Hill Church. I want to say a greeting to a few of you who may be visiting for the first time. We're glad you're here. And greetings to a couple of our friends who are watching at home. Uh, we miss you all and look forward to your return. Um, as you all know, as has been signified even by the songs we sung this morning, this is the time of year when you hear phrases like Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or other such things. We see phrases like that not just offered as a greeting. It can even be a farewell. It's a way to say goodbye. We see them written on cards. We see these statements uh, posted on advertisements for things like tacos. I mean, it's all over our culture right now that everybody's saying Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Holidays, and the like. This is supposed to be a time of joyful celebration. It's supposed to be a time of good cheer. And for many people, this really is, as the song says, the most wonderful time of the year. It's a time where we get together with family. Family gatherings can be a blessing. A time where we enjoy good food. A time where many people exchange gifts with one another and enjoy different family traditions. It's a time of various uh, holiday festivities. Maybe you take your kids to go cut down a tree, or maybe you go and, and see Christmas lights somewhere, or go ice skating or something like that. At the very least, most of us take a little bit of time off school or work to celebrate Christmas. But for some people, this is not the most wonderful time of the year. In fact, for many, Christmas is actually a very painful time. For some, family gatherings can be a source of strife. There's conflict. For some, perhaps they don't have a family, or, or maybe their family has no interest in getting together with them. There's no relationship there to enjoy. The holidays are painful. Some people don't have the resources to buy a Christmas dinner. It's mac and cheese, ramen noodles, just like every other day of the week. Others will work on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. There feels, it feels like there's really nothing that special about it. And even if the Christmas holiday itself is joyful, even if you have the best food, even if you get great Christmas presents, even if you make wonderful memories with your kids and your parents and your aunts and your uncles, we all know that even those holiday things, as nice as they are, are only a temporary reprieve from the realities of life. We know that Christmas, the, the holiday, will come and go. We know that New Year's Eve will come and go. And when January hits, we'll still be facing the same discouragements, the same cancer, the same finan financial pressures. We'll be dealing with the same besetting sins, grappling with the same loneliness, facing the same broken relationships. For those who are suffering, joy, like we sang about this morning, may seem impossible. And the Christmas season is no exception. And to wish people like that who are suffering, to wish them a Merry Christmas, can almost seem like a cruel joke. Maybe that describes someone you know. Maybe that describes you. What are we to do with the reality of suffering? How does Christmas hold out good news to those of us who live in a world that is broken by sin, a world that is marred by sorrow and suffering, a world that is under a curse and scarred by death. 
My goal today is to reflect on the coming of Jesus. And what I hope to do, although we're not going to be in one passage, unlike most Sundays, I'd like to draw out several different encouragements for you. Encouragements for those who suffer. Encouragements that I think we find in Jesus Christ. And the first is this. Number one, we find encouragement when we remember that Jesus came to share in our suffering. When we celebrate Christmas, when we think about the birth of Jesus, we need to remember that Jesus came to share in our suffering. Suffering is part of what it means to be human. That's the human experience. But we need to remind ourselves that it wasn't always that way. In the beginning, everything was good. In fact, it was very good. God created all things and blessed them. He found or he formed Adam and Eve and and placed them in this perfect garden. And he charged Adam to cultivate that garden, to keep that garden. He blessed them greatly. He gave them everything to enjoy with one exception. They were not to eat from one tree, and, and you know the story. Satan entered into the garden in the form of a serpent. He deceived the woman so that she disobeyed God. And he therefore forced Adam to make a choice. Would he obey God or would he follow his wife in rebelling against divine authority? And we all know the tragic story that Adam made a fatal choice to sin. And his sin as the representative of humanity brought disastrous consequences on the entire human race and even on the creation itself. Although mankind had enjoyed perfect blessing from God, Sin brought a curse. The curse meant that life would be hard. Work would be hard. Childbirth would be hard. Marriage would be hard. And it meant that sin would spread. And this moral evil would bring disease and sorrow and hardship and ultimately bring death. They would die just as God said that they would, despite the lie of Satan. From dust they had come. And to dust, they were destined to return. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul tells us that just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. But it's not only bad news in Genesis chapter 3. It's not only a curse on the creation and on the man and the woman. God also provided hope that day through a promise. He told them that one was coming through the seed of the woman who would bring rescue to people who lived under a curse. God spoke to the serpent in Genesis 3.15 and said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That promise that a redeemer, a deliverer would come through the seed of the woman. That promise is fulfilled in Jesus. That's what the birth of Christ is about. Jesus came to rescue those who live under the curse, but get this, he would do it by becoming one of us. The Son of God became a man. As John chapter 1 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is none other than the Son of God. He's far more than a baby. He is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no creator. In fact, Jesus is the one through whom all things have been made. He dwelt since eternity past in glory, in unapproachable light, having perfect fellowship with the Father. But when Jesus came to earth, he took on flesh. He became one of us. And when he did that, Jesus entered into a world, a created order that was broken and cursed. As we saw last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, although Jesus was rich, indescribably rich, he became poor. One result of this poverty, this humility of Jesus taking on flesh and becoming one of us is that the Son of God would experience human suffering. Jesus, though he was divine, was not immune to the realities of life on this earth. Jesus walked in our shoes. He knows what it's like, for instance, to be hungry, to be tired, to feel pain. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. In fact, I think Jesus knows the strength of temptation even more strongly than us because never before was Satan so motivated or so intent to make a man fall. 
And the full force of temptation is really only felt by those who never give in, who press all the way through to the end. And Jesus did that. He was tempted, yet was without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to have family drama. Think about it. His brothers rejected him. They didn't believe his message. They thought he was crazy. They were embarrassed by him. Jesus knows what it's like to be misunderstood. The crowds didn't realize who he was. His family didn't understand. His friends, even the disciples, often seemed to have trouble understanding who Jesus was and what it was that he was actually going about. The authorities definitely misunderstood him. They accused him of having satanic power. That that was the explanation for all of his miracles that he did. You have to wonder, did anyone really understand Jesus in his human life? Jesus knows what it's like to experience loss. By all accounts, we don't see Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, in any of the gospel accounts. And church tradition holds to the fact that Joseph likely died when Jesus was young. Jesus also knows what it's like to bury a friend. His dear friend Lazarus became ill and died. And in one of the shortest verses in the Bible, we're told that Jesus wept. He grieved over the loss of his friend, the suffering his friend experienced, and the way that that loss and that sorrow was affecting his sisters and his other friends and family. Jesus knows what it's like to experience loss. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. Judas, one of the 12, someone Jesus personally selected and poured himself into for three years, sold Jesus out, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed, and he knows what it's like to be abandoned. When Christ was arrested, all of his disciples fled. All of them. They bailed. They ran. They left him standing there to be arrested alone. Jesus knows what it's like to be slandered, to be mocked. His enemies and the authorities in in the mock trial and in his crucifixion, they slandered him, they derided him, they mocked him. And Jesus knows what it feels like even to die. I don't know what that feels like, and neither do you. None of us have died yet, but Jesus has. He knows what it feels like to cross from life into death. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says this about Jesus. It says that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and get this, and acquainted with grief. Acquainted means that he's very familiar with it. First-hand experience, Jesus came to share in our suffering. And because of this, Jesus can sympathize with us when we suffer. Jesus can identify with us in our suffering. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 says that he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. One of the hardest things about suffering is that it isolates you. It makes you feel alone. Because no one, this is at least how we we feel in the moment, no one could possibly understand what I'm going through. No one could possibly understand what I've had to go through in my past. But listen, the perfect and sinless Son of God came to share in our sufferings. And he knows what it's like. He knows what it's like, not just in his divine omniscience, because he's God and knows everything. He knows what it's like in his human experience. Jesus came to share in our suffering. And friends, this offers us encouragement that the one we worship, the one we trust, the one we embrace as Savior and King, he can identify with our suffering. He is not immune to it. It's not a foreign experience to him. And Hebrews 4 tells us that this means we can come boldly to him for the help that we need when we suffer. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
Pastor John Piper, in his outstanding little book, 50 Reasons Jesus Came to Die, writes this. We are likely to feel unwelcome in the presence of God if we come with struggles. We feel God's perfection and purity so keenly that everything about us seems unsuitable for his presence. But then we remember that Jesus is sympathetic. He feels with us, not against us. This awareness of Christ's sympathy makes us bold to come. He knows our cry. He tasted our struggle. He bids us come with confidence when we feel our need. Yes, we suffer. But the one we worship knows firsthand what it's like to suffer. And he invites us to draw near to him when we need help. And because he sympathizes with us, he promises to give us grace. That may be temptation of of a pull towards sin, or it may be the trial of facing difficult and painful circumstances. But in either case, we are invited to draw near with boldness, to find the help and the grace that we need. Because the one who sits on the throne, our priest, our king, is sympathetic. He knows our weaknesses. He came to share In our suffering. There's a second encouragement I want to offer you. Not only did Jesus come to share in our sufferings, but Jesus came to suffer in our place. He came to suffer in our place. The curse of sin means that life is hard, life is painful, yes. But the ultimate grief, the ultimate suffering is death. And death is the consequence for our sin. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18 tells us that the soul who sins shall die. That means that all of us here are guilty and deserving of death apart from Christ. And so as sobering as that is, as sobering as it is that we're all going to die one day, consider this, apart from Jesus Christ... If Jesus doesn't come, if Jesus doesn't provide salvation, if Jesus doesn't die on the cross, then get this. Death is not the end of our suffering. It's the beginning. It's only the beginning. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 says, Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Likewise, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 tells us, By the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says that one day he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We don't often like to talk about hell. We don't like to think about hell. We feel uncomfortable when someone preaches on the doctrine of hell. But no honest discussion of human suffering can avoid the reality of hell. Yes, we suffer because of Adam's sin in this life. And yes, we suffer when others sin against us. But our own sin earns the righteous wrath of God and the eternal suffering of hell far outweighs any suffering that has ever taken place on this earth. People say all the time that they've been through hell or that their life is hell. And I do not think they know what they're saying. But here's the good news. Jesus came not just to suffer with us, As a man in a broken world, Jesus came to suffer for us as a man who takes the place of men on the cross. Jesus does more than just demonstrate solidarity with those who suffer. Jesus offers himself as our substitute. On the cross, Jesus experienced the outpouring of the Father's wrath. He bore all the wrath of hell as he hung as a man incarnate on the cross. Again, if I could point you to Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 4, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. 
We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think about that. The baby Jesus, the baby who was born in the manger, was born so that he could die. He became a man so that he could die for men. And he tasted death not for his own sin because he had none. He was perfect and pure and spotless and holy. No, he tasted death because of our sin. His suffering on the cross purchased forgiveness for us so that we could be spared the eternal suffering of hell. The wrath of God against us was not just canceled. It was diverted. It was redirected from us to Jesus, and he absorbed that wrath by his suffering on the cross. And that means there's no more wrath left for those who believe. It's already been spent at the cross. That's what the word propitiation means, that Jesus has absorbed the wrath of God, and he has satisfied God's righteous demands. Hebrews 2.17 again says he had to be made like his brothers, like us. He had to become a man so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. There is no more wrath left in the heart of God to pour out on those who believe because it's already been spent at the cross. And this is good news for those who suffer No matter what we face on this earth, no earthly sorrow, no worldly grief compares to the reality of hell. And because of what Jesus has done, we who believe in Christ need not fear suffering in hell. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 tells us. And that's good news. But there's more. Christ's substitutionary work did more than just absorb the wrath of God. It also purchased something for us. It secured on our behalf eternal life. It purchased heaven. And this too speaks to our suffering. For those who are in Christ, no earthly sorrow or grief compares to the coming glory of eternal life that Jesus purchased on the cross. I love what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 18. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the suffering we face in this life does not compare to the glory that is going to be revealed to us? Listen, for the unbeliever, as awful as life can be in this world, this is really the best it will ever be for them. This is the closest to heaven they'll ever get. But for the believer, for the one who has repented of his sin and trusted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the believer, this is the worst it will ever get for us. This is the closest to hell we will ever come. Because Jesus suffered as a sacrifice on the cross, we have hope of eternal life. We have been rescued from the ultimate suffering of hell, and we have been guaranteed the eternal glory of heaven. And this truth, this truth offers real hope to those who suffer. It provides an eternal perspective. It empowers our perseverance. It gives real and lasting comfort and peace. Jesus came to share in our suffering, but he also came to suffer in our place, as our substitute. But a third encouragement I want to offer you this morning, finally. Not only did Jesus come to share in our suffering, and he came to suffer in our place, but Jesus also came to end our suffering. He came to end it. You see, the birth of Jesus, what we celebrate at Christmas, is just one part of a larger story. A story that begins, as we've already talked about, with a good creation and a tragic fall. A story that's moved forward as we see the pages of the Old Testament unfold. A story that moves forward by the promises of God. As he makes promises and raises up a people and establishes a kingdom and promises a Messiah. This story tells us of a God who makes a stunning provision through sending his son, Jesus Christ. And Christmas isn't the end of the story. We know that Jesus grew to be a man. And he suffered. He died. And then he rose again. 
And what this Jesus is now doing, the, the part of the story we now find ourselves in, is that this Jesus is now redeeming sinners. He's ransoming and rescuing sinners, setting free those who are in bondage to sin and death. And he's adding them to his church. He's building his church. And this same Jesus promises to return. He promises, he promises to establish his kingdom in the fullness of his power. And that one day he will bring all things to glorious consummation and make all things new. Jesus came not just to share in our suffering. Not even just to suffer in our place. But ultimately to end suffering once and for all. To undo the effects of the curse. And to restore his original purpose for his creation, that it would be a blessing, a place of goodness and life and joy and peace. This victory of Jesus is accomplished in his death and resurrection. Jesus triumphs over our enemy through the cross. And I love this, that Jesus didn't just defeat sin and defeat death and defeat the curse from long range. It's not like he called in an airstrike, you know, over the radio. Or that he was a sniper from long distance taking out our enemy. Jesus entered into the trenches personally. And in hand-to-hand combat, Jesus entered into the grave itself and defeated sin and death and Satan. The power of sin and death has been broken. Colossians tells us that Jesus has plundered the domain of darkness and, and brought people out of that kingdom and into the light. And Jesus will soon bring this victory to completion at his return. Although we live now under a curse, we live now today in a world that is broken by sin, a world that is, that is harassed by our enemy Satan, a world that is marred by death. Listen, it will not always be so. The New Testament is filled with hopeful anticipation. Turn to Romans chapter 8. We've been there already, but I want you to see this. The New Testament tells us that it's not just us who's looking forward to this great consummation, that the whole creation itself waits for this coming renewal when the effects of the curse on the created order will be undone. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 19, it tells us that the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Romans 8 tells us that there is something coming for us. Resurrection, renewal, when these bodies will be made perfect like Jesus. No more to struggle with sin. No more to experience pain and disease and death. And it's not just our bodies that are looking forward to this. It's the whole creation itself. And we are to eagerly look forward to this. Through Jesus, one day death itself will be destroyed. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This glorious chapter that talks about the resurrection of Jesus and how that resurrection changes everything. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, Paul tells us that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that's coming. It is coming. Death has an expiration date. Death has an appointment with the risen and returning Jesus Christ, the King of glory, who has the keys, who has the power over death. In verse 53 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? I love this. The Apostle Paul quotes the Old Testament. He quotes these prophetic words. And it's like he's talking trash to the enemy. Where's your sting? 
Where's your power? You lose. Paul continues, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over sin and death comes through Jesus Christ. He came to end our suffering. When Jesus returns, he'll establish his kingdom, a kingdom of peace in which righteousness dwells, and there will be no more sorrow. In Isaiah chapter 60, the prophet speaks of this coming kingdom, and he says, Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall no more be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you its light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning will be ended. What good news to those who suffer, that the Lord will be with us, that he will be our light, and our days of mourning will be ended. We know that in the end, <clears throat> all things will be made new. Flip back to Revelation chapter 21, the end of the story. In Revelation 20, 21, 22, we see everything that God is doing in history being brought together in this glorious consummation. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, the Apostle John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne, that is Jesus, said, Behold, I am making all things new. That's how the story ends. Jesus came. He lived a righteous life. He died. He rose again. He's been exalted to the right hand of the Father and given great glory. And he is going to return and make all things new. And that will be the end of our weeping. It will be the end of our dying it will be the end of our sinning, the end of our suffering. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire, and the smoke of his torment will go up forever and ever, chapter 20 tells us. And we will dwell with God. Our life today may be marked by suffering, but our future is bright because of Jesus Christ. This is the hopeful expectation the joyful confidence of those who truly know Jesus Christ. All who have repented of sin and believed in his gospel have this hope. If you don't have this hope, if suffering in this world is the end for you, if Jesus Christ has not atoned for your sins, if you've not repented, confessed, and cried out to him for mercy, asking him, to forgive you, to cleanse you, to make you new, then this hope is not yours, but it can be. It can be if you will come to Christ and bring nothing except your need, bring nothing except your confession, bring nothing except your weakness, and humbly ask for his mercy. He will redeem you, and he will give you this hope. You'll have a sympathetic high priest who knows what it's like to suffer. And he will offer you grace day by day, moment by moment, as you face life in this broken world. He will give you the comfort and the hope and the assurance that he has already suffered in your place. And that the eternal suffering of wrath and hell is something you don't have to be afraid of. And he will give you hope and comfort to know that one day suffering will end. And you will enter into his rest. He will wipe away every tear and make all things new. 
Friends, there is something much deeper than just family and tradition and sentimentality at Christmas. We're celebrating something far more than that when we sing about the birth of Jesus Christ. We're remembering the birth of our Savior. We're remembering the incarnation of the Son of God. And this is why we can rejoice. This is why we can have joy even in the face of suffering. We don't sing joy to the world because we're blinded to the realities of life. We can sing joy to the world because we know who Jesus is. And we know what Jesus has done. And we know what Jesus promises to do. The gospel good news of Christ's birth gives us comfort and hope and even joy in the middle of suffering, in the middle of loss, in the middle of pain, in the middle of weakness, even in the face of death itself. We can sing joy to the world because the Lord has come. We can sing joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies because this one who was born would crush the head of the serpent. We can sing rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel has come to thee, O Israel. God with us. Let me ask you this, Christian. Do those songs reflect the joy of your heart? Do they? Can you rejoice? Can you be merry at Christmas? Or does all of this feel hollow to you? If your own suffering or if the hardship of those around you has eclipsed your view of Jesus this season, then let the word of God today correct your vision. Let the grand story of Scripture capture your imagination and sweep you up into hope and confidence, even a hope and confidence that sometimes mingled with tears, mingled with sorrow, but nevertheless a hope and confidence that is grounded in what God is doing. Let the truth guide and direct your heart today to behold the Son of God, the Savior who was born for us, the one who came to share in our suffering, the one who came to suffer in our place, and the one who one day will bring our suffering to a glorious end. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we look across the expanses of Scripture, we see time and time again a real reason for joy, a real reason for hope. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love for us your willingness to enter into our suffering, to come here and to take on flesh and experience suffering as a man. We thank you for how you suffered on our behalf at the cross. Apart from your work at the cross, we have no hope. We have no real reason for joy. The best we could hope for are the flimsy and temporary joys that the world has to offer. But Jesus, we thank you that through you we have hope of eternal life, that our suffering will one day end. And it's all because of you. It's because of your power, your goodness, your sovereign plan, because of your glory, because of your grace towards sufferers like us who are also sinners, undeserving of such grace. Lord, for those in the room today who are suffering, for those who carry a load of sorrow and care, I pray that they would find in you today the comfort that they need. Not the comfort that always comes through the removal of immediate suffering, but the comfort that comes through faith in Christ, knowing that you are good and that you do good. Lord, fix our eyes on Jesus, and whether our Christmas is filled with happiness and good memories and celebration, or whether our Christmas is filled with difficulty and pain, I pray that in the midst of all of that, our joy would be rooted in Christ, all that he is and all that he has done for us. Amen.